to the Elevate Louisiana Engage podcast. Elevate Louisiana was founded in 2020 to empower women leaders throughout Louisiana by connecting and educating them on the challenges impacting our state with data-driven nonpartisan solutions to make a better future for Louisiana. Today, we'll be hearing from Barry Irwin. He is the president and CEO of CABLE, the Council for a Better Louisiana. He will be leading us through a thought-provoking exploration of education policy over the last 50 years in the state of Louisiana. I happen to be fortunate enough to be talking to Barry when he was preparing this presentation for our newly elected um, Louisiana Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, or BESI. And uh, when I heard about it, I just wanted to get the opportunity to share it with our listeners. And Barry was kind enough to um, let us do that. So um, here we are, without further ado, introducing Barry Irwin with his presentation on education policy in Louisiana. Well, thanks very much for the opportunity to visit and kind of go over this with you. Um, I did put this together for some new Bessie members and, and some older Bessie members a few weeks ago. And it was an interesting uh, trip down memory lane in a lot of ways. Um, but one thing it also kind of showed me going on through there was a lot of this stuff, even if you go back quite a bit in time, uh, 20, really nearly 30 years ago on some of this stuff, it's still very timely right now. And we're still talking about a lot of the things that, that um, we were actually talking about then. But I do think it's helpful um, for a lot of folks who are interested in education and, and kind of are somewhat familiar with the things that we've been doing over the last several years to kind of have some context and some history. And so that's kind of what this is about. Um, so I'm not going to try and get in the weeds too much with with folks on this. There is a lot of material here, but but we'll kind of go quickly through some of it. Um, but I did want to start a, a little bit with the kind of the early days of kind of how we started, uh, particularly with our accountability system, which is so, um, you know, pivotal even to what everything that we're doing today. So to go ahead and get started, really thought I would go back way back in time and kind of putting things in context for us as a state, um, if you go back to the 20th century and really the first half of the 20th century, education was not that huge of an issue in Louisiana, largely because, you know, we were a, a very agrarian population. We had a lot of folks who were working in agriculture and in rural areas. At the same time, we had, you know, the um, growing chemical industry, growing oil and gas industry, lots of opportunities for jobs and pretty well paying jobs for, you know, kind of a, a generally so poor, poor Southern state. Uh, we were actually, you know, in, in pretty good shape uh, economically for a lot of reasons because of that. And for that reason, you know, education was not the issue that, that maybe it should have been that we would have liked it to be in terms of priority or importance. We did pretty well, our people did because of the jobs that were available, but then really is now, we were really among the, the most uneducated, um, you know, um, people or states in the country. At the same time, while that was going on, we were kind of dealing with this two-tiered society, which of course, education was a key part of it. Our schools were segregated, they were separate, they were not equal. Um, we had big disparities in terms of what um, resources and educational opportunities were available to, to folks in our state uh, based on race. And really, it wasn't until Ruby Bridges in 1960 that the first school in Louisiana was actually desegregated. Um, that was a long time ago. But again, that was only the first school. And when you start talking about reforms, I'm not sure I would call desegregation a reform, but it was really the first kind of step into what would later come uh, reforms, paying attention to what was going on in our schools. And the desegregation process, while you know it started in 1960, it really lasted through the entire decade of the 60s, really up until about 1970. So it took us 10 full years to actually desegregate our schools. And of course, during that time, it was there was a lot of turbulence, um, a lot of uh, tensions you know, across the state and in many areas as, as we were doing that. Um, certainly uh, painful, uh, growing pains uh, for a lot of folks, but trying to get us, of course, to a place that we needed to be. Um, during the 70s themselves, after a lot of that um, um, integration had happened, desegregation, we really see some of the first reforms that we ever had at the state level. And they were kind of small by our standards today, 
but it was our first step, just kind of a small step into taking, uh, putting in place um, state academic standards and curriculum uh, assistance for school districts. And by academic standards, we're really talking about, you know, kind of the expectations that we had for students uh, that what they should be able to learn and know how to do, uh, you know, in various grade levels. And that's the first time we had that. If you kind of move into the 80s, I'm kind of remembering when I first started as a reporter with Buddy Romer becoming governor, education was a huge issue in his campaign. And he kind of campaigned on the idea of raising teacher pay, um, but also taking our first steps towards what we would probably call accountability now. And that was with um, stronger teacher evaluation. So it was a process, kind of a two-step process where he really worked hard to try to increase teacher pay, but doing it at the same time, added a component of uh, accountability with kind of teacher evaluations. Now, um, the teacher pay raises passed, the teacher evaluations passed, but then Edwin Edwards came in right afterwards and got rid of the teacher evaluations. So it didn't last for a real long time. In the 90s, um, education really became a big issue again in terms of you know beginning to talk about reforms. Teacher pay was a really big issue, and we were so far behind, and there was widespread you know, interest in increasing teacher pay, but at the same time, there was a sense that we needed to understand more or better the return on investment. Like, we wanted to increase teacher pay, but we wanted to make sure that we got some improvements in you know, education outcomes out of that. So that brings in a really interesting period with the election of Governor Mike Foster. Now, if some of y'all were around at that time, you might have seen the TV commercials. He had a welder's mask on. He was riding a tractor. He was shooting a shotgun. He really wasn't talking about education very much. And when he was, he was talking about eliminating the Bessie board as his version of reform of education because he didn't think they did much. The irony of all that is, is that if you go back now and look, Mike Foster was probably the most education governor in terms of accomplishments that we've had, you know, really in, in these last three decades. Um, and the ironic thing about it is while he campaigned to get rid of Bessie, what he actually ended up doing was appointing two very strong Bessie members, which the governor can, can appoint three members to Bessie. He appointed three very strong people in Leslie Jacobs, who you may know, and Paul Pastorek, who really just energized the board into something that, that really um, created the first wave of real reform uh, in, in kind of what I would consider our modern era. Um, the first thing, we'll talk about some of these in a little bit more detail. Early childhood, it was our first pre-K program for four-year-olds, a high-quality program that, that eventually um, went statewide, first time we'd done that. Our first charter school legislation, um, the creation of the community and technical college system, which I think we all understand that was a huge thing and, and kind of a gap that we had for, for decades that we were one of the only states that did not have a robust community college system. A lot of talk and work on teacher pay raise. And something we're going to take a little bit more of a deeper dive on was the creation of the school and district accountability system, because we put that in place back then in the um, late 1990s. And it is still kind of the bedrock piece of some of our reforms that guide so much of what happens in our public schools today. Now, going back to that time, I think we have to remember that we really did not have a very good idea of how our kids and how our schools were performing. Um, NAEP is a national test, which you may have heard of, that was just really getting started um, in the early 90s. Um, it's National Assessment of Educational Process. Uh, uh, progress, uh, also called the, the nation's report card. And it told us that we weren't doing very well. We were basically last. 60% um, of our kids were uh, scoring below basic in reading. That was basically last in the country. So we knew overall that we weren't doing very well, but we had no idea really of how our schools themselves were doing and our, our districts either. I mean, you could see graduation rates, but even that wasn't a really good barometer. So in 1997, uh, Pretty soon after Mike Foster came in, the year after, we created our school and district accountability system. And here's kind of the way we went about doing it real quickly. 
Um, it was a year-long process, involved a lot of stakeholders from, you know, the teaching community, educators, principals, um, the business community, the civic community, and um, Cable was involved with it, and, as well as some other organizations, and also some outside groups that really helped bring some um, experience and expertise to what was a very, very new thing going on around the country. There were only a few states that were doing things in the area of accountability, and uh, we focused on five of them, uh, particularly Texas and Florida. Florida. And with that um, work during that, that process, we divided or created a framework for our uh, accountability system that really rested kind of on four major tenets. And they're ones that are really still part of what we have today. I mean, the first thing was to clearly establish goals for students. We certainly had never done that before. The next thing, and this was hugely important, was to create a way for this accountability system to be able to communicate with the public, with taxpayers, with the legislature, with policymakers about how our kids and our schools were performing, something we had not been able to do before and something we wanted to make sure that we got right, that people would understand what that meant and it was crystal clear. We wanted to definitely um, take account of student growth pay attention to how well um, our students were doing in terms of growth. And we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a minute. And then the, another thing that was hugely important was to focus attention on schools that need improvement. We were looking at things kind of in a broad sense, but what we really had under our face and weren't paying attention to were schools that were chronically underperforming doing very extremely poorly for our students, and they were not getting the attention that they needed, uh, you know, to be able to turn around. So in 1999 is when we actually launched the accountability system. What it, you know, consisted of is really kind of a lot the same way as it is right now, our statewide standardized tests. We called it LEAP back then, and we still call it LEAP. Again, one of the things that was important is the accountability system required every school district to identify the 20% of the lowest performing schools in that district and provide them with attention, but also with the help of state resources, um, specially target inter targeted interventions. And these are schools, again, that were largely being ignored by our school districts um, you know, sometimes not by their own fault. They didn't have a good sense of what was going on in a lot of them either. But what happened with our accountability system is it, for the first time, it gave us a, a clearer snapshot of what was going on in our schools, which ones needed the most help, and then the accountability system helped by providing resources to, to create those interventions. So each um, school um, got a two-year growth target, so we wanted them to grow. We knew growth was very important, and so we gave them targets and goals for two years. And for those schools that met those goals, and, and a lot of them did, especially in the beginning, um, they got rewards for their performance and particularly for their growth. And we set a goal um, for you know all of our kids at that time. You know, Again, we're starting in 1999, so we're looking at 10 years ahead to say that by the time we get to 2009, our goal was for every student to be at a level uh, that we call basic. We had five basic categories. I shouldn't say basic again, but we had five categories of labels that we, we kind of put on where students were. They were at the lowest level, unsatisfactory. There was an approaching basic. There was basic. Then there was mastery in advance. So we wanted our kids to get to the level of basic. And as we'll see in a minute, that wasn't really the true goal, but it was the goal we set for ourselves at that time. Um, talking about basic, we have to be honest with ourselves. And kind of at the time, we were honest kind of behind the scenes about it. It was sort of a nod, nod, wink, wink. Um, we set that goal of basic in a very political way and a very deliberate way. But I would also argue the way that was the right way. And by that, I mean, Back then, our students, when we first got those tests back from LEAP and took those kind of benchmark things, we knew our students were, were, were likely very far behind, but they were they were really far behind. They were at, at low, low levels of, uh, of performance, um, particularly, I'd have to say, in the New Orleans area, but in many of our other districts, too, they were at just very, very low levels. So if we had set a level of expectation to get to an area where we really did expect and want our kids to be, it really would have been an unreachable goal. So we set our goal at basic, and even with basic, we set a very low score, cutoff score, um, kind of um, 
uh, bar to get over at probably uh, one of the lowest levels we could. And the reason was, as again, on purpose, if we would have said it the right thing, I think the results would have been so overwhelming to the public about how poorly our kids were doing. It may have killed the entire accountability system and everything we were trying to do. So we set it at a low bar, but with the idea that we were going to raise that bar as we went along. And as we can see, you know, our fourth graders and our eighth graders, um, even with that low bar, weren't really performing at huge levels, but they were kind of at acceptable levels for the public to understand. But if you look at how our schools overall were performing, you can see behind the curtain a little bit. We had more than 1,100 of our schools, you know, 84% of them that were performing at below the basic level. So, you know, they were not performing at that level. We only had a little over 200 that were really, you know, above basic. That wasn't very many, but it was, it gave us our benchmark and it gave us, you know, our starting point and a place to grow from. So again, I mentioned growth and that, that's been an important part of our accountability system from the beginning. And it's still something that we're talking about quite a bit today. And part of the reason that the growth was so important was because, again, we knew we were starting at such a low level. We knew we weren't going to get our kids to where they needed to be, you know, in like, you know, overnight. But we also knew that we had to, you know, reward schools that were doing well, acknowledge, you know, performance where things were going the way we wanted them to go. And growth was the way to do that. Be able to say, OK, we know you're not totally where you need to be. But man, you're showing good growth and we have growth targets. And if you keep hitting those growth targets and you keep improving, we are going to get towards where we need to be. And so the way they they did that, they got titles, which you go back in time, you still see them a little bit now, but you'd have those school signs out there and they would put up on their signs. This is a school of exemplary growth, which was one of the, the um, labels that we gave them. And they also got cash rewards. And, you know, it wasn't a lot of money, but it meant something to those schools and they did things with them. And it really helped spur, you know, a lot of improvement in our schools, particularly in those early years. So this is kind of how that focus on growth worked. We go back to 2001, we had 59% of our schools meet their growth targets at that time. That was pretty good. That's almost 60% of our schools hitting their targets. In 2002, that dropped below that, but it dropped in a year when we raised our expectations. So like I said, we knew we started low, but we knew we were going to raise expectations. So when we raised expectations, you know, the expected happened. Um, we, we dropped in terms of schools that were meeting their goals. But the thing I think that is key is when you look to 2004, a couple of years ahead, our schools didn't totally recover to where they were with the growth targets, but they made pretty good progress. And when we look at some of the charts that we're going to look at in just a minute, you're going to see these points where we were growing, we changed our standards, we raised the expectations, we had a drop, but over time we continued the trajectory that we were on, which I think sent a very powerful lesson that we could in fact raise expectations and increase rigor, and we could still grow and in, improve performance for our students on a trajectory that was really um, not so bad. Um, to see how that looked like just in percentages, you can see the percentages there for um, ELA is English language arts. It's basically reading and writing, math over that 10 year period, you know, pretty substantial growth across the board in terms of student performance. One of the things that we knew we had to deal with, but never really had the data to do until we had our accountability were equity gaps. And we knew our African-American students and white students were not performing at the same levels for, for all the reasons that we know. Um, resources, economic uh, disadvantage, poverty, all of that. But this kind of put, you know, a, a number to what that looked like. And so this is from our baseline in 1999. And as you can see, the students and African-American students was huge. I mean, really from almost a third to 40%, you know, difference in terms of percentage points. But I think one of the things that was really important about our accountability system, and one of the things that it got right, what it, 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 folk, it forced us to focus on those kids who were basically in the shadows for years and years and years before that, because it put a spotlight on them. And it said, we're not going to let them hide in the shadows. We're going to show how they're performing, and we're going to make sure that we report that out. And I think what this shows is encouraging. While 
we have not closed all our equity gaps, and I would not be here sitting here telling you that we had. One of the things I think that was significant is that the growth of our African-American students uh, during the first, in this case, 15 years, actually has exceeded the growth of white students. And that tells us a couple of things. One, it, it put to bed, to rest, that kind of myth that was sort of existing at that time that, oh, these black kids can't learn. Oh, these poor kids can't learn. Well, guess what? They did, and they grew at levels exceeding our white students. Again, not to the levels that we wanted to in, in totally closing the gap, but it sent the message that we can teach all students and all of our students can learn. So this chart is a little complicated, but it tells us several things. And I just want to spend just a minute on this for you. Basically, if you look at that chart, it is the history of our school accountability system seen through the lens of student performance, basically for fourth and eighth grade reading and math. So we're looking at the um, performance level at basic or above because that's where we started. That's not our standard now, but for the sake of this chart and kind of continuity, we're, we're, we're tracking just that one thing across the board there. And it tells us a couple of things. First, if you look to the to the far left and kind of follow over the first decade, what you see is a pretty good, pretty consistent trajectory of growth. Yep, there are ups and downs in there, but by and large, those ups and downs occurred when we raised those expectations. So you can kind of see from year to year, roughly, um, when we raised expectations, things kind of went down, but then typically things went back up. So if you look over the course, at least of that first decade, and I would say getting a little past that into just about 2013 or so, we're on a pretty good trajectory of growth. We're not where we need to be, but we're, we're at least growing year over year over year on a kind of average basis over that period of time. But then you get to 2013 and the graph looks a little bit complicated. It gets muddy and it gets busy in some ways. And that's because there are a lot of things going on uh, within our accountability system in some cases and externally in other cases that really kind of has made it difficult over the last 10 years to get a full grasp on exactly where we are in some ways. So what am I talking about? Well, in 2013 is when we implemented our new academic standards, which were very controversial at the time, you may recall, common core standards. Um, that was adding a new level of rigor uh, you know, to our standards and new level, higher expectations for students. And of course, there was a reflection in that there. At the same time, the next year, we changed our test to a transitional test, which was kind of a hybrid between our old test and a new test that we're moving to. Then we moved to another test, the new test in 2015, which was based on some national things. But that was controversial um, politically with the legislature. And uh, I like what I so I'm going to turn it back on. Um, and so we switched to another test. But what happens when you do all that during that period, it's changing the bar every single time. It's changing, one, what students are expected to, to know, but the test changed the scores too. And then, of course, after that, we've had COVID. So when you look at that period of time, there's been a lot of change, a lot of, you know, uh, disruptions uh, uh, in, in a sense to things. And, and we're really needing to get to a point where we can bring back some consistency and get ourselves back on track. But that's kind of a little history of the accountability piece. I'm gonna go through some of these kind of quickly, but I think they're really important. I go back to early childhood. Our first state level early childhood program was in 2000 uh, with the LA4 program. It was only for four year olds. It was the first statewide program that was deemed and, and really um, you know, validated as a very high quality program. And we started with very, very low participation, which was bad. The good news was over that period of time till today, we've basically reached kind of universal access for kids in this four-year-old program. The key to remember though, is that was only for four-year-olds. It was a quality program. But if you recall now, our conversation now is not so much about four-year-olds. It's about birth to age three, because that's the next uh, area that we have to do. But I think the good news here is that we, when we did put that focus on four-year-olds, we actually got some results, good results, just with that group. And I'll show you this, this chart real quickly. This is something, some research we were involved with ourselves over time. Basically, what this did was look at the cohort of the kids that came into that LA4 program. 
again, just four-year-olds that very first year and then followed them. Actually, we ended up with about three cohorts that got past high school when we were doing this research. So this is about three cohorts through high school and beyond high school and compared that group of kids that had LA4 to kids that had no access to any publicly funded pre-K program. Now, maybe they were in something in childcare somewhere. We don't know about that, but they were not in a publicly pre-funded uh, program. So what were the results? You can look at them on the screen. They kind of vary a little bit, but I think it's pretty um, significant to note that in just about every single one of these indicators from graduation to tops to English to math, um, our kids that went through the LA4 program did better with just a one year dose of pre-K education. That's all, one year dose. And the only indicator that actually went down is a good one, placement of kids uh, with uh, students with uh, special needs. And that went down 45%. And that is a huge number for this one group of kids that only had that access to that one extra year that something as significant as that happened. So I think what that tells us by extrapolation is if we, you know, can go earlier from, you know, to the birth to age three that we've all been talking about, we can see even more significant results. Unfortunately, we don't have the research on that type of thing right now. Um, another big significant thing in early childhood happened in 2012, and actually another, that was a, a year for another whole wave of education reforms. We passed, passed something called Act 3, and we also passed something called Act 1 and 2, which I'll get to in a moment. But Act 3 dealt with early childhood education, and I won't go through all of these things, but basically what that did was really vamp up our standards and you know expectations of what we could do in early childhood actually including that birth to age three factor. Now, birth to age three, we're not talking about public schools or anything like that, like we were with the LA4 program. We're talking about child care centers. But what we were able to do with this, because many of our child care centers accepted students that did have public support, or in, in the sense that some of the kids themselves had you know, public dollars paying for them, was allow or, or kind of allow the state to impose I hate to use that word, but to put standards on those to, to these um, child care centers that wanted to participate that allowed them to increase their standards, to increase their quality, and to give us as citizens and people uh, a, a rating system so that we could look at these private child care centers and get a sense, though, of how those centers were performing through kind of a star system is what it was at the time. We use a letter grade now, but it was a rating system that allows us to see the quality, you know, features that were in those programs. That was a huge step forward at the time, one of the first states to do it in Louisiana, and it's something we've continued to build upon over time. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to this episode of the Elevate Engage podcast. Before we dive deeper in today's topic, I want to take a moment to tell you about an incredible event that's in Making Waves in Louisiana. If you're passionate about leadership, legislative advocacy, and shaping the future of our great state, you won't want to miss the Elevate Louisiana Annual Legislative Leadership Conference. This event brings together the movers, shakers, and change makers from across Louisiana to discuss critical issues, exchange ideas, and ignite change in our state. At Elevate Louisiana, we believe in the power of leadership and advocacy. Join us for a day of inspiring talks, panel discussions, and networking opportunities that will empower you to make a difference. Whether you're a seasoned activist, a budding advocate, or simply someone who cares about the future of our state, this conference is for you. Mark your calendars for Elevate Louisiana's fifth annual Legislative Leadership Conference on February 29th, 2024 at the Hilton Baton Rouge Capital Center. It's easy to remember our date this year since it's Leap Day, so be sure to visit elevatela.org. That's E-L-L-E-V-A-T-E-L-A.org to register for this event where we're going to feature Governor Jeff Landry, Speaker of the House Philip DeVilliers, and Senate President Cameron Henry, who will share with us their priorities for the upcoming regular session of the Louisiana Legislature. Tickets and tables are available at elevatela.org. Now, let's get back to our podcast discussion. But remember, 
Elevate Louisiana's annual legislative leadership conference is where you can be part of something bigger to make your voice heard and to lead the change you want to see in our great state. Be there. Thank you for your attention. And now back to the show. Charter schools in Louisiana started in 1995. That was, uh, again, right with uh, Governor Mike Foster coming in. Um, the, a big significant thing happened in 2003, though, with the creation of the Recovery School District. Now, some of y'all may remember that and think about it in terms of Katrina. And because it says Recovery School District, most people think that it was an outgrowth of Hurricane Katrina. In fact, it was started two years earlier with the idea that we were going to try and help recover you know, some of our students from failing stool, schools. And the idea was, and it started on a very small um, basis, was to say, um, we're creating this recovery school district. It's run by the state. It will have the authority to take over chronically failing schools, put them in the recovery school district with the idea of converting them into higher quality charter schools. And in fact, that's what the, the original intent was. It began in New Orleans, really with just a handful of schools the first year, a handful more schools the second year, with the idea, though, that if we had high quality charter operators taking these same schools and these same students and we saw better results, it would kind of increase momentum to, you know, bring about more conversions into high quality charter schools. That was the premise. But then Katrina hit 2005. And guess what happened? Uh, you know, a year or so later, a year later, the legislature passed legislation that basically took over all of the chronically failing schools in New Orleans, which was basically all the schools except for just a handful, and over time converted them to charter schools so, so that today New Orleans is, a, you know, basically a 100% charter school district. Um, there you can see the data. I mean, basically, of all of our public schools, about 14% of our, our students are in public charter schools right now, mostly in the southeastern part of the state, certainly, again, all in New Orleans, a good chunk in Baton Rouge. But then you see some some spots really in 25 parishes, but, you know, some in Lake Charles, some in Lafayette, some in Shreveport, um, but really more in the southeast is where the concentration of our charter schools is. I mentioned Act 1 and Act 2. Um, these kind of dealt with some other aspects of, of um, education reform, uh, particularly with teachers. Um, we did some changes in our teacher evaluation system to make the evaluation system and the evaluations based more on performance and student growth. That was controversial. It remains controversial to, to some degree, but it was a step that actually um, kind of put more of a quantitative measure on uh, evaluating how our, our teachers are doing. We made some major changes in tenure. We didn't get rid of it, um, it totally, um, but effectively we made it more difficult for incoming teachers to earn tenure. The notion being that we, we it created some difficulties in many school districts for um, superintendents and principals to make changes that they needed to make because of tenure laws. Um, so today we still have tenure, it's, it hasn't gone away, but we've increased the um, expectations for what is needed for a teacher to obtain tenor, uh, tenure, and it's changed that a lot. We created some new course choice options. That's mostly for students who maybe were in a school and wanted to take some courses like an advanced math, advanced science, something was not available in their schools, um, but could be available from another vendor or online to pay for them to take these added classes, or again, maybe it's another language that wasn't offered, kind of a, a choice offering for students in that regard. We did something with school board reform that Cable was heavily involved with, mostly giving superintendents more flexibility as CEOs of their school districts uh, to get out of from under the thumb to some degree of school board and school board politics, who were um, in some cases where you had school board members themselves individually hiring principals, hiring teachers, placing teachers, that type of thing. So we created more autonomy for superintendents, uh, a little bit more autonomy for charter schools. And we expanded our voucher program, which at the time was a very small program, um, still is actually, but at the time was a very small program only in New Orleans. Uh, with that, we expanded that to a, a statewide program, but it's still um, relatively small. Other reforms of note during the period kind of after that, we raised academic standards. I mentioned um, that's the common core standards that were controversial at the time, but it was an increase in the rigor of our expectations. Um, we did some things to kind of help um, school districts 
use and access higher quality curricula that are tied to the standards. In Louisiana, we don't dictate what curricula school districts use. They can use whatever they want to. Um, but what we do do is create a list of tiered kind of um, curricula that are available um, in a tier one, two, and three based on quality and have encouragements and incentives for districts to use those, though they are not required to. Focusing a lot on teacher preparation on the front end, we know that if we want our kids to do well in the classroom, we starts with a, a really well-prepared teacher. Uh, residency programs were a part of that to try and help those teachers get over that first year or two hump of getting into the classroom and finding things were not the way that they were expected or that they learned in, in, in college uh, to help them with that. Um, we created some new pathways for students. Um, before, basically, we had a university pathway. It was to a four-year degree. Um, what we did with this um, uh, um, thing in the in the 2000s was uh, to create a career diploma, which started out, I have to say, not very strong, not very good, but has grown into a real pathway where our students in high school can say, yeah, I'm going to go to a university. I want to go to LSU or wherever. That's fine. Get my tops. Or if I want to go on a career path uh, to a, a technical career, there's a pathway for them in high school to do that, too. And last on this list, we required students to fill out the um, federal financial aid assistance form, which doesn't sound like a reform, except it actually was a, a pretty big step forward. We were the first state to kind of require uh, students to do that. Uh, other states are doing it now. And what it really did was it, it showed all of our students in high school who are looking to go to head you know, to a community college or wherever, exactly how much financial aid might be available to them, thinking perhaps that it was unaffordable. When they fill out this form and they see the financial aid opportunities, it helped a lot of our kids get over that hump out of high school into realizing that they could have, you know, a career in post-secondary education. So some of our much more recent reforms, um, we created really the first of its kind, a K through two accountability system. As you may have noticed, looking back at our accountability system, we really started in third grade because that's when we start giving standardized tests. We don't really do that to those kids at those younger ages, but we do some things. We, we've had some problems with literacy in recent years. We do do screenings for kids. They're not tests, they're not grades or anything like that, but they are screenings that help us know where our kids are in those earlier ages with that fundamental need to learn how to read. Um, so we have incorporated that into an accountability system that's still pretty brand new in a lot of ways, but we think is going to help us focus on that literacy in those early years. Um, we've also passed some, some policies, which I'm sure you saw at the legislature this year and last year, talking about uh, following the lead of Mississippi in terms of what they have done in terms of early reading, where we had really kind of been on a downward um, trend in recent years. Mississippi had been on a strong upward trend. We have put some of these policies in place just over the last two to three years, and we're already seeing some successes there with the science of reading, which is kind of a, a different approach to teaching reading. It, it focuses a little bit more, quite a bit more on phonics, phonemic awareness, those types of things, but we've seen some good results. Um, implementation of fast forward, that really is kind of put our, our career diploma, our career pathway uh, thing that I just mentioned on kind of steroids to uh, really increase opportunities for kids to get, you know, associate degrees or, or um, uh, technical training, career and technical training, education, while they're still in high school. Um, that's got a lot of promise, but we've seen some good results. And we passed the teacher pay raise this year, which for the, the first time included a differential pay for teachers. We, we've always done things pretty much across the board. And I think one of the, the goals this time was to keep uh, reserve a piece of that. I think I think the total pay rate was around 200 million. I can't remember the exact number, but basically what this does is take about 25 million of that and say to schools, you can and you should use this, you know, for specialized circumstances. Use this to pay extra to a science teacher that you really need and can't find one, or a math teacher, or an, a language teacher that you can't get, or to reward a teacher who is doing a great, great job. Uh, for the work that they are doing. So to to provide across the board raises for everybody, but a differential component um, for at least some, you know, in, in certain circumstances. 
So those are some of the things that kind of where we're leaving off with things right now. I'll kind of close on this by saying something that I said kind of at the beginning. To a large degree, we are still talking about some of the same reforms, the same policy changes and ideas that we talked about in the very beginning when we started down this path. So accountability, it's still on the table. There are still things that we need to do to kind of tweak our accountability system to make it stronger, to make it more transparent. Charter schools are always a controversy. Um, we've got a lot of charter um, schools in Louisiana, uh, one of the higher percentages in the country. Um, they've established themselves in many ways, but they continue to come under attack year after year at the legislature, and there are issues around them. Um, efforts to school choice continue. We've seen that in the legislature in the last couple of years. We will certainly see it again in the coming legislature to, um, I think, at least uh, proposals to broadly expand uh, school choice options, particularly when it comes to private schools and, um, and even homeschooling and to a large degree. We still need to do funding for early childhood. Teacher evaluations are going to pop up again as a controversy. Academic standards Common Core was controversial, but we change our standards and we update and revise them periodically. And as we've seen recently with social studies and um, early childhood um, standards, they remain a controversy. But I guess I would just close in saying that, you know, we've been involved in the education arena for a long time. And we'll be the first to say that we are not where we need to be, that our kids still um, have need opportunities to grow and perform at higher levels. But that said, nobody can say that Louisiana has sat by idly doing nothing. We have done a lot over the years. And in fact, in many ways, for many years, Louisiana has been seen as a leader in what we have done policy-wise to try and improve student performance. Has it gotten us to the higher levels that we want? Not yet. And we are seeing progress. There is no question we've made progress, but no question that we have farther to go and, and no question, though, that we have done a lot to try and do that. And I'll close by saying this, too. One of the challenges that we have, and it is not an excuse, but it's just a reality that we have to think about. Um, we have a very high percentage of our kids who are in poverty, economically disadvantaged, and we know that is a challenge. We also have the second highest, I think, percentage of kids in private schools in the country. So a lot of our kids are not even in the public school system. They're in the private school system. And we have a large and growing number of kids who are homeschooled, too. So to a large degree, our public schools are dealing with some of the kids you know, who are the most economically disadvantaged and face the most challenges. And again, that is not an excuse, and I don't even mean to imply that in any kind of way. But our schools do face challenges in some ways that schools, you know, in other states don't in the, in the same type of way. But that notwithstanding, our kids are far better off today than we were when we started down this road in the late 90s, um, early 2000s. And, you know, I still see a path ahead and a trajectory ahead where our kids can do better. And we're even seeing that a little bit in some things, even post-COVID um, with early childhood, I mean, with early um, literacy and early reading where our kids are actually, you know, held on better than they did, you know, to than a lot of other states did with, um, you know, the aftermath of COVID. So with that, I'm going to kind of end it. I know we went through a lot in a short period of time, a lot to digest, but if you have any questions, comments, thoughts, I'm happy to try and, um, you know, answer any questions or have whatever discussion that you would like. Thank you to Barry and just saying what a blessing it was that I happened to be talking to him when he was about to go do this presentation for the Bessie board. And I, I just immediately saw what a great opportunity it would be. And, and I wasn't wrong. Um, Barry, you and Cable have been such a great asset to our state for a long time. And just thank you. Thank you for all the work over the years. Thank you for this presentation. And, um, you know, I think the thing that got me the most was when I when you opened with the 1970s and I thought, oh, my gosh, it was like when I was a kid in school that we even started to think about academic standards and curriculum goals. That was amazing to me. And it just it helped me to realize, um, you know, I look back over my own family and I mean, 
I was the second person to graduate from high school, you know, and um, because it just wasn't as valued um, when my in my grandparents' era and certainly in my great grandmother's era. Nobody, I mean, a lot of people didn't graduate from high school, you know. So I guess. One first thing I'd like to know is how late were we to the standards and goals setting game? Like the top states, which, you know, oh, <laughs> some of the, that's all right. We stick on mute. So we've all got problems. Um, you know, how, how, how much earlier was some of those top performing states to that game? You know, it wasn't all that much earlier. I mean, in the sense education in our country, you know, largely was kind of along that same path where, um, you know, every state was different and it still is. Um, but you had pockets of states that were doing things. But I mean, in our region in the South, there really wasn't a lot in terms of, you know, reform or putting those things in place. I mean, it kind of came as a movement, um, you know, kind of collectively as a country. I mean, again, states did it in different at rates at different paces um but within a you know it's kind of within a broad period that we started moving in those things but i mean again if you look to that history the reason i started off the way we did we just weren't paying attention to education i mean everybody went to school but, but that was about it and if you didn't finish school it wasn't a consequence i mean our our graduation rates were were, were pathetically low i mean because there was not a, a social or expectation necessarily that you had to because you could go do other things and it really wasn't till later till you know all of those things kind of began to kind of coalesce together that um we kind of figured out we really need to do better and it was really the 90s i mean the the mid to you know late 90s where this notion of of trying to have uh, some better sense of how our students were doing collectively as a state or even as a district or as a school began to take place. I mean, we just had no data. And I think that was the thing that was so frustrating to people like Leslie Jacobs at the time and, you know, Paul Pastrick and others. We knew we weren't where we needed to be, but we really didn't know where we were. And we certainly didn't know by school. And we certainly knew that we were leaving a lot of kids behind and, you know, for all kinds of bad reasons. But anyway, long answer to your question. Well, um, Leslie Jacobs happens to be one of our founders of Elevate, if you didn't oh. notice. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So um, we, we, we really respect and value all the work that she did for sure. Um, one more question that I have, and then I, I, I'd like it for other people. You can start raising your hand um, would be good. And Mallory can call on people. Um, but one of the things that, in my understanding, that was always different about um, charter schools were that they weren't necessarily in the retirement systems. Is that still true? Is the whole New Orleans system not in the retirement systems? It it depends on the schools. They actually have the flexibility to go either way. The law is very clear that says they do not have to be in the retirement system. But, you know, some some of the charter schools, particularly at different times, it depends on their mix of teachers. Like some of them hired a, a lot of people who came from the traditional school district. They already were vested in there. And when you had, you know, a certain critical mass of, of those teachers, it was really to the benefit of the the teachers themselves to stay in the retirement system. So in those cases, those schools do. In others, you know, they never went that way. And, um, you know, they got a different mix. A lot of more younger, you know, teachers that are coming in, teachers that may not plan to stay in the profession forever, they definitely want the flexibility to get some retirement and then go to wherever it is they go. So what you see is a mix. And, um, but they're not required to be in the retirement system, but, but a number of them are. All right, um, Paula Polito. Thank you, Julie. And um, Barry, my name is Paula Polito. I am all things early care and education. And this was by far one of the most thorough, comprehensive um, 
programs, uh, PowerPoint presentations that I've ever seen. Uh, my father is always secondary education, so comes from that world and early childhood. Um, you brought up so many wonderful points, and uh, I appreciated the way you sort of thought through the word when you said Act Three put some, you know, accountability on childcare centers. And for me, who ran a privately owned Type Three childcare centers center, it was exactly what I had yearned for for so long because I come from um, an MBA, right? No early childhood um, experience necessarily. I bought a family business and I wanted to do what was best for kids, but I didn't know exactly what that looked like. And in my opinion, the class tool or that accountability system, the observation research-based tool gave me that North Star. So I applaud the state's efforts, and I know that was a lot of, you know, um, some John White and so forth, um, Act 3, but it was wonderful. And I also appreciate your comments around many other states looked at Louisiana as the, you know, the progressive state that did school readiness tax credits. Wow. Yeah, How can, you know, so, I mean, it was just probably the most comprehensive thing I've ever seen around um, education as a whole. And I want to thank you for that. Oh, well, thanks so much. And, you know, I think you're right about the, the Act 3. I, I think one of the things it really did was help a lot of these child care centers that wanted they wanted to improve. They wanted to, to improve their quality. They didn't all necessarily know how to do it, but it, it kind of gave them, you know, a framework, a way of doing that. And I know one of the other things that it did is when we started putting, you know, some of those um, ratings on some of those um, child care centers, I think some of the ones um, that people paid a lot of money to go to and felt like they were really high quality ones didn't get as high a rating as many thought they would. And probably they didn't think they would. But you know what it did do? It increased their deal in a year or two. They got their ratings up. And, and so I think it it, it is a, a catalyst to really improving the quality of child care across the board in our state. So I couldn't agree more. And prior to Act 3, there were those opt-ins, quality rating system. Um, before a quality rating system, I went and got an AC accreditation because I needed to know. I needed to learn more about what quality looked like. So I applaud the state's efforts and um, continue to look forward to seeing how early care and education is going to grow. But again, thank you for the, the presentation. Oh, well, thanks so much. One of the things that I wondered is, you know, you talked a lot about needing to have data so that we could know where we stood, know where we needed to get to, et cetera. I know that there was some controversy over a data privacy uh, bill that was probably put in in 14, 15, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and wondering where do we stand on that? Have things loosened up to where we can track adequately or, you know, just where are we? Yeah, that that was a really you know, tight piece of legislation. And for the benefit of, of other folks, you know, it was kind of during that Common Core period, there was a lot of concern about all kinds of things, honestly, um, and, and things getting hacked or whatever, but also people using data in inappropriate ways for kids, which of course never was the intent and nobody ever wanted to do that. So what it did was it, it put some real constrictions on how we could use data to track students um, not for any reason except to see what was working and, and what was not. Um, and so it, it was very difficult for a period of time to fast forward to answer your question. Yes, we passed some legislation just this past session and, a, and another piece of the session before that I think are really going to be helpful for doing that, for loosening things up, not in a way for people to be concerned about because you don't get any student identifying information whatsoever. But the reason it's so important is because if we've got students who are in, say, this program or that program, we want to know if that program is making a difference. And we can do that by tracking over a period of time. And if we can see these kids who are in program A, whatever it is, or this this track that we're, we're, we're looking at, and they go on and they graduate, they go into post-secondary, they get a job or whatever, we can track them through the workforce, not them, but just their numbers and, and see what happened then we know these things have been successful. We know these are the right things to do and we can increase the investment in these things. And then when we see they're not working that great, okay, we can phase those out and, and then focus our, our resources on things that we know that are working. 
But to answer your question, we did pass some legislation in the last year, and especially this year, that I do think is going to make a difference in a positive way to be able to track all the way from early years into the workforce, which is a key component, even to the fact where you can see what kind of job somebody get and not know their personal salary, but know in that career what kind of salary they could be making. And those things are hugely important. Yeah, that's great. And it always, it, it really, when I got, when I was in elected office, one of the things that surprised me the most is, and is just the lack of knowledge we have about our people and even births and deaths and all the steps in between that we, we don't know anywhere near as much as I thought we did coming into it, you know. Um, hey, you mentioned, Jill. oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Hey, this is Val. How are you? Good to see you. Um, I just I just had a quick comment and I wanted to echo um, what Paula said. Very good, very, very good presentation um, from beginning to end to kind of recap what's happened in Louisiana. And I think, you know, a big part of that, um, the push for early childhood education and the and the work in that space, I think a lot of that's got to be community led. Um, I serve on the on the board of the Rapids Foundation. And so we're doing a lot of work in that space and it's actually just been in the last few years, but you know, the foundation did just intensive in-depth study as they always do before they, they dole out money in the form of grants on the impact of literacy with kids in elementary school. And so it all kind of rolled back to zero to three. And so we have a great initiative in our area um, in Rapids Parish where the Community Foundation has partnered with the Rapids Parish School Early Childhood Program and we've established a fund and we've raised a lot of money. And so the foundations, I say a lot, I mean, we've raised like yeah. three or $400,000 from the community and the foundations matching it one-to-one -one, and then the state also matches it one-to-one. -one. So, I mean, all those things I think are going to help to um, increase the improvement in the education that our kids are getting as they, um, all those other reforms are so important, but to just focus on that age group so they're not at home, they're in school basically when their minds are developing. So, but anyway, thank you so much for that. And Julie, thanks for, for putting, putting this together. Thank you, Alice. So good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, you know, you had mentioned Barry. Fast forward. Um, yeah, and it sounded like the dual enrollment and stuff like that. Is that the same thing, or is it? Yeah, it is. It's a part of that. It's a part. It's it's dual enrollment in the sense that kids are getting. Um, um, exposure and opportunity to either credits or credential. Uh, college credits or credential in the high school setting. But it's also got a, a strong focus, I think, on the career piece of it, which, you know, dual enrollment can be just a, and I'm not putting this down, but but it, it's simpler in some senses, um, just, you know, some English classes, some math classes to get you ready early. So when you go to college, you've already taken those classes. But the fast start thing also deals very, you know, um, um, are in a targeted way with the career side in, in a more, um, I guess, pronounced way so that it, it identifies some pathways, identifies pathways that are tied to um, high paying jobs or high demand jobs in the region where you are. And, and it does a, a, a better job than we were doing before, I think, with connecting those, you know, to the jobs and to the employers and that type of thing. So at the end of the day, it is kind of a, a, a I won't say glorified, an expanded dual enrollment thing, but it has a particular focus on that career and technical education side that um, you don't see in some of the other, just when you say dual enrollment. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I think in Elevate, we've, we've talked a lot about how important dual enrollment and for kids that aren't gonna go to college, let's get them ready to do something. Let's get them positioned to, 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 to get out of high school and be making reasonably decent money, you know? Yeah. Maybe even sometimes good money right out of high school. Um, and then I don't know if there was anybody else because it's probably gonna be the last question unless somebody raises their hand. But, um, you know, I'm part of that large percent, you know, whose kids are going to private school um, who both graduated now, which is kind of fun. <laughs> Congrats. <laughs> 
Yes. Um, but, you know, they both had really heavy loads of AP courses. And, you know, when I think about dual enrollment, I think, well, those AP courses were sort of like dual enrollment, yeah. you know, if you, and, and, and is dual, is that AP curriculum, is it very robust in our public schools? Yeah, it's getting more so for sure. I mean, going back a few years ago, we had really low participation in AP uh, advanced placement type courses compared to other states. We were, we were just low and we made a concerted effort. And this is kind of towards the end of the jump white era, I guess you would say, to say we need to, to beef that up and do that. And so there are things within our accountability system that provide incentives for um, high schools to provide more of that and to make that an important part of that. And when you put that in the accountability system, then you do see results. And we we definitely are. So the the participation in the AP classes in general and dual enrollment, they're all on an upward trajectory. And that's really good. And, you know, they took a little bounce during COVID, but they I mean, drop, but they really bounce back and and they're really on a, a, a much, you know, a very strong trajectory that we really want to encourage to continue. So, yes, indeed. And, you know, while you were talking about that, it gave me one more question <laughs> and maybe. But what's our graduation percentage now? Like what percentage of kids don't finish high school is, I guess, what I'm concerned with? I think we're at 80, 82 percent graduation. Um, between 80 and 82, we had a bump up at 82. It kind of weirdly went up during COVID, which may have been some anomaly. Um, but we're a little above 80% graduation rate. I mean, that's low. We, we, I mean, the goal, we should at least be around 90. Um, but we have definitely made progress on that. We were in the 60s, you know, 15 years ago. Um, so. Yeah. Wow. Whew. Yeah, it's amazing. So. Um... Last call, I got a feeling I could ask questions for the rest of the night, but we're at 435. So um, unless someone else um, rears up real quick, we're just going to thank you, Barry. You've just done a very, very good job um, putting this together. And we feel very lucky to have had you on and had a chance to interact with you about it. Thank you for your service to our state for many years. And uh, we're excited to keep working with you. Well, thanks so much. Okay. And I certainly appreciate always the opportunity to interact and uh, work with y'all at Elevate. Yeah, well, y'all too. Well, we appreciate you and uh, we'll be talking soon. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you for joining us today to discuss the history of education policy in Louisiana. Thank you also to our speaker today, Barry Irwin with the Council for a Better Louisiana. Barry, you're just such a great asset to our state. We appreciate your knowledge and the many years that you've spent working for the benefit of our state. Let's carry the energy and inspiration from this discussion into our communities, schools, and policymaking arenas. Together, we must strive for excellence and build a brighter tomorrow, one step at a time. Goodbye, and let's keep the conversation alive. <laughs>